This is Lesson 19-1, Background to Revolution. New chapter, new unit, new topic. It's all new. What were the factors leading to the revolutions of the late 18th century? Well, we've got a new topic, College Board Topic 5.1, Contextualizing the 18th Century State. Explain the context in which the European states experienced crisis and conflict from 1648 to 1815. The spread of scientific revolution concepts and practices and the Enlightenment's application of these concepts and practices to political, social, and ethical issues led to an increased but not unchallenged emphasis on reason in European culture. We've seen that before, but here's a part of it we haven't seen. Revolution, war, and rebellion demonstrated the emotional power of mass politics and nationalism. We've seen this already, Britain's ascendancy, and this plays a role in this particular lesson, which is the background revolution. Explain the economic and political consequences of the rivalry between Britain and France from 1648 to 1815. The rivalry between Britain and France resulted in world wars fought both in Europe and in the colonies, with Britain supplanting France as the greatest European power. With regard to our time frame... We've got the English colonies, we've got France, and we may even have a little bit of Haiti. Key concepts in the background to revolution. The Seven Years' War, classical liberalism, racial privilege, mob rule, and the Treaty of Paris of 1763. There have been a lot of treaties of Paris. We often say that the Enlightenment sparked the political revolutions of the 18th century. But the Enlightenment by itself really wasn't enough to do it. Now, Enlightenment thinkers, they liked their political theories and they liked their calls for reform and for change, but calls for outright revolution and getting rid of monarchs entirely, that was a rare thing for Enlightenment thinkers. It was going to take something more concrete and more tangible to get these revolutions going. Then, maybe the Enlightenment could provide a structure for what would come next. And there were three processes that made these revolutions possible. Number one was social change. Number two, growing demands for liberty and equality. And there is your Enlightenment influence right there. And then the third process was the Seven Years' War and its financial fallout. Let's start with that first one, social change. Certain social changes were serving to destabilize European society. And there were three types of people in Europe. You had your nobles, and they were the largest landowners, only 2% of the population, and they owned 25% of the land, and they received all kinds of privileges, and they were exempt, often, from direct taxation. You had your middle-class groups, and they consisted of professionals and merchants and guildmasters, and these also got some privileges, they were also allowed to monopolize, in other words, keep the riffraff out of many economic activities. And you had your poor peasants and you had your urban laborers, and they were the vast majority of the population. They bore the brunt of the taxation. They were excluded from privilege. And by the way, this idea of privilege, this concept, that's something we're going to devote more time to in the French Revolution. As European economies grew, inflation kept pace, and peasants and urban laborers worked harder and longer hours to keep up with inflation. And more poor women and children worked as well. Middle class investors grew wealthy. They got rich from rural manufacturing, like we talk about. They also got rich from overseas trade, including African slaves. And so there was a growing gap between the rich and the poor. But the line between the nobles and the middle class was beginning to blur. Some nobles invested in trade. Wealthy merchants bought land and titles. So nobles and merchants intermarried. And otherwise, nobles tended not to get their hands dirty with business. The regime of racial privilege developed. Slavery needed to be protected and legitimized. And you can't defend slavery without an ideology. Otherwise, you're in danger of seeing that it's evil. Racial privilege meant new entitlements to Europeans. 
European law had to be made to accept that only Africans and people of African descent were to be slaves, and free people of color needed to have severe restrictions on their rights. And racial privilege had to be enforced by whatever means necessary. Growing demands for liberty and equality, that's our second process. What did liberty mean, though, to an 18th century, quote, liberal? It meant two things. Number one, it meant individual rights, and that includes things like freedom of worship, freedom from censorship, freedom from arbitrary laws, freedom to do anything that doesn't harm someone else. Individual rights was a radical idea in the age of absolute monarchy. The second thing that liberal means to an 18th century liberal is a government in which the people are sovereign. The people have some kind of representation, and we've studied this with people like John Locke. The people make the laws. The monarch, he still has an important role in the government. However, his power is limited by the will of the people. Popular sovereignty, the people ruling, that was a radical idea in the age of absolute monarchy. What was equality? What did that look like to liberals in the 18th century? There were three main exceptions to equality. Number one, gender equality. That was seen as neither practical nor desirable. For example, women in politics? Who thinks that's a good idea? Nobody in the 18th century. So women didn't vote and women didn't run for public office. What about racial equality to an 18th century liberal? Well, certainly the slave trade was awful, but total emancipation of the slaves? That's potentially dangerous. You might be able to do it really, really gradually, but enslaved people needed to be taught the skills of running their own affairs first, and that was seen as taking time. Economic equality to an 18th century liberal. 18th century liberals were totally okay with rich people being rich and poor people being poor. As long as every free white male has a chance at economic gain. So what was representative government to these 18th century liberals? Did it resemble a democracy? Did everyone get to vote for their representatives? No. That would be equivalent to what they saw as mob rule. And as they viewed it, we need to have some restrictions. Voters, for example, should only be males. And perhaps they should also have a stake in society. In other words, own property. I mean, do you want somebody who owns no property voting for representatives who will pass laws governing your property? So looking ahead, what's going to happen when these liberals take charge? Number one, people below them are going to be clamoring for such things as universal male suffrage, political rights for women and free people of color, total emancipation of all slaves, reduced economic inequality. And the questions are, how far should reform go? And to whom should it apply? The Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. As you know, we've already taken two swipes at the Seven Years' War. This will be our third, so it's basically review. Keep in mind that the Seven Years' War was about two things, really. Number one, the balance of power in Europe, and number two, the domination of global trade. And there were about, this is kind of fluid, but let's say about five immediate results of the Seven Years' War. They didn't happen overnight, but they were immediate, and they caused the American Revolution. But first, let's just review the causes of the Seven Years' War, just so we're sure about this. You had unresolved issues from the War of Austrian Succession. The ruler of Austria, Maria Theresa, she wanted Silesia back from Prussia, which had taken it from her. And she also wanted Habsburg, that's her family, Habsburg dominance over German-speaking affairs rather than Hohenzollern dominance, Prussian dominance. But Prussia stood in the way. And so the struggle for trading and colonial empire between France, 
was also a big factor. Those two competed for dominance not only in Europe, but also in Asia and America. It was England and Prussia against France, Austria, Spain, Russia, and Sweden. And whichever alliance won stood to share huge gains in both areas. In America, there were English and French territorial disputes west of the 13 colonies. Britain eventually managed to destroy the French fleet in the Atlantic in the Battle of Quiberon Bay off the French coast in 1759. And this allowed Britain to divert resources from Europe and attack the French in Quebec, in Canada. So the aftermath of the Seven Years' War was the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Number one, Britain was the big winner. It gained world naval superiority over a vast trading and colonial empire. Number two, France, on the other hand, was defeated and humiliated. France lost Canada and everything east of the Mississippi to Britain. Louisiana, which it had been in charge of, also went to Spain to make up for Spain's loss of Florida to Britain. France lost most of what it had in India to Britain, but France still had several very profitable colonies in the Caribbean, including Saint-Domingue off on the island of Hispaniola. Both countries, Britain and France, were left deep in debt. Both countries raised taxes to repay these war debts, inspiring protests and calls for tax and other reforms. France, Spain, the Dutch Republic, and others began to seek opportunities to exact revenge against Great Britain for defeating them. 